chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. You have come to a mountain that can, can be touched, uh, that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, uh, darkness, gloom, and, and storm. To a trumpet, uh, bless, I'm sorry, to a trumpet blast, uh, or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no, uh, no further word be spoken to them. Because they could not bear uh, what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and, and the sprinkled blood that speaks better uh, Word speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us in heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken must remain. Therefore, since we are receiving kingdom, the kingdom and cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. May God bless to our hearing and to his kingdom the reading of his holy scripture. Thank you, Terry, for sharing that uh, scripture. This is a thing we want to look at. We've been looking all summer at the general theme of the wonder of it all, based and on 2 Corinthians 1.9. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And uh, today, we're going to look at one of the wonders that's not so fun to look at, uh, because, but it's part of it. And uh, how many of you have uh, ever been through an earthquake? Hold your hand up. You've been through an earthquake? Back in about 19... 67, somewhere back in there, 67 or 68, we were living in the little town of Salem, Illinois, birthplace of William Jennings Bryan. And uh, some friends of ours from Missouri, the church I had served and had pastored, the first church I'd ever pastored in southwest Missouri, there, they had come to visit us. And we were sitting there just talking and visiting away, and all of a sudden everything just began to shake. The house, and we were inside, and so... The first thing that went through my mind is I got to get outside where it's not shaking. <laughs> and the thing that really caught my got my attention is all of a sudden I realized, you know, there's no place I can stand that's not shaking. And maybe you remember some of those same thoughts and same feelings. I remember this man's brother, who was actually my pastor under whom I served in another church before I became a pastor. He and uh, one of our mutual friends were out in California when the big Los Angeles earthquake took place. And uh, it woke uh, Jim up. They were in the motel where they were doing a conference out there. And <coughs> Jim got up, got dressed, and he tried to wake C.D. Sally up. His name was C.D. He was uh, from Arkansas. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the problem. I don't know. But uh, anyway, he couldn't wake C.D. up. Uh, C.D. just kept sleeping. So Jim just got undressed, climbed back in bed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> thought, well, if we go, we're going to get together, you know. And, uh, but there's a time coming, in fact, it's already here, I believe, 
when God is shaking everything. And that's what I want to talk about today. And the reason we want to look at this passage is because it's easy for us to look around at everything that's going on, whether it's in a family situation or a personal matter like health or finances, or whether it's political like is going on in our country right now, or whether it's things going on globally in relationship to <coughs> Afghanistan and the Taliban and China and all these different things that everybody is up in a flurry about. And uh, we need to understand something very important, and that is the Bible clearly predicted that this was going to happen. Jesus himself, in the 24th chapter of Matthew, sat down with his disciples not long before he went ascended to the Father. And he said, this is what you can expect. In fact, even before his crucifixion, when he was meeting with his disciples in the upper room at the last Passover, he spent... And we have it in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. Jesus told his disciples, this is what's going to happen. And, and then he prayed this great intercessory prayer. I made reference to it last Sunday. I think it was when we were talking about the, the wonder of intercession, what it means to be an intercessor. And in the 17th chapter of John, Jesus I to praise 10 specific things for his disciples. And that includes you and me. He prayed. Over and, and it's one of the most amazing studies. If you want to take time to do a, a, a study that will really enrich you, uh, take time to study the 17th chapter of John. It's just a powerful, powerful chapter. Paul then, when he's writing to this young pastor, Timothy, when he writes to him the second letter he wrote to him, you see, Timothy, and Timothy's an interesting guy. He's a wonderful uh, young man to look at, and I love the, you know, one of my favorite verses of Scripture. In fact, our ministry in, in Ukraine, when we were missionaries there, our entire ministry is built on 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where Paul, or Paul told Timothy, he said, Timothy, the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, the same, those same things you commit to faithful men who will in turn teach others also. You have four generations in that one verse of scripture, four generations of discipleship. Now, in the earlier part of that chapter, or that book rather, in the first chapter, or, or, or the, uh, the, uh, the third chapter rather, uh, he describes to us, he says, there, there's a time coming when perilous times will come. And then he goes on and he describes all these things. And when you read either that Matthew 24 or 2 Timothy 3, all of a sudden you think, good grief, it's like I'm watching the news. Because the things that are going on there we see happening today around our world. I don't remember a time, in my lifetime at least, when there was so much chaos, confusion. I remember saying, back in the early 1970s, when I would preach on the second coming of Christ, and one of the things the Bible talks about is there will be wars and rumors of wars. And at that particular time, there were over 150 hot spots around the world, even back in the 1960s, in the 1970s, where people were fighting. And why were they fighting? Scripture says nation will rise up against nation. The interesting thing about that, it's not talking about political issues. The Greek word for nation there is the word ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic, ethnicity. Have you ever remembered in a time in your life when ethnic groups were so at each other's throats all the time? You see? And so why do we need to look at this particular topic? We need to look at it not so we can moan and groan, but because too many of us are moaning and groaning. We get all bent out of shape and all uptight, and if anybody in the world today ought to have faith and confidence and hope in the time of turmoil like we're going through, it ought to be those of us who claim to follow Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we look at and we see with open eyes the facts. But there are some facts in the spiritual world that we fail to see sometimes and we need to be reminded. That's what I want you to see today. Because we need to look at the wonder of the shaking. Why is this all this, all this happening? You know, there's a passage of scripture in, uh, in, in Jeremiah 12, 5. My dad pointed this out to me many, many years ago. And it says this, if you're running with the footman and you're getting tired, then what are you going to do when the horsemen show up? Think about it. If you think it's bad, just wait a year. Wait a, wait a week. Now, and this is not a doom and gloom thing. I want you to understand.
understand that. And you have the study sheet for you to take home and look at on your own and, and spend your own personal time going through some of the things that I've listed here. But we need to understand a couple, very, a few very important things. I want to concentrate primarily on two of them. But the first thing we need to remember is who it is that's doing the shaking. And this may, it makes it very, very clear. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews does an interesting contrast here. He talks about the Mount Sinai, and then he, and he contrasts it with, the Mount Zion, with Mount Zion. Now, Mount Sinai is the place where the law of God was handed down. And in handing it down, there were the requirements and the demands placed on man in order to satisfy his sin and to make himself right with God, to be able to have access to God. And out of that whole concept over the centuries, we have developed what we call a performance mentality of, of Christianity. But it's not just the, the performance mentality that finds itself within the Christian circle, but it's also the performance mentality that, that is a part of the human heart. Paul makes it clear in Romans 1.20 that every human being has an instinctive awareness of God in his life. And so there is really no such thing as an atheist. There are people who hope there's no God, but there is no one that can convincingly say there absolutely is no God. And so you have the, the secular mindset today, uh, which is basically trying to solve all of the world's problems. But how are they doing it? They're trying to do it on the basis of performance. And what is, and, and if you remember two years ago in our first series uh, here, we talked about this, I, the, the theme was considering critical questions. And one of the first questions we looked at and spent several weeks going through that was, uh, is man religious by nature? Because many people say no, but man is religious by nature. So you have to ask yourself the question, then why? And the reason is because we were created exclusively for God. And so here we find ourselves in this situation where you have the performance base where we're trying to not only reach God through human standpoints, but we're even trying to be God. And then on the other side, you have Mount Zion. Well, the word... Mount Zion was basically the mountain of praise. It's the idea of living in, a, in an experience, a relationship with God that is constant, that is focused on and built upon a, a sense of worship and awe and adoration and, and surrender and submission to the one who has created us. So if you want to know who it is that's doing the shaking, he's the one. He's shaking this whole aspect, this whole area, and he's dealing with this area. And if you look at the scripture that Terry read, it talks about, you, do, you, do, you, do, you don't come, listen folks, you don't come to the mountain, Mount Zion with a heart of fear. The only mountain you come to, <laughs> the only mountain you come to with a spirit of fear is the performance base. Because you, did, you realize that when you have done your best, you still have not satisfied the requirements of God. The only way you can satisfy the requirements of God is through the person of Jesus Christ. And then we look also at this uh, question of uh, who, uh, who's God shaking? And you see the little list that I put there. And I want you to cut. Basically, the bottom line is this. He's shaking everyone. Even the most devout Christian, even the most mature believer, there are things going on in that person's life that is creating a shaking. I would suspect that almost all of us in this room today have had some type of experience within the last 12 months where our faith and our confidence in God has been jolted. Some tragedy that unexpectedly took place that we had no idea about. Some political thing that we didn't have a clue it was going to go that direction. All of a sudden, bang, there it is. And we get that shaking. And so you see the listing in, in the little note sheet that God is shaking at those people that are in high positions. And those people that are in strategic positions, have you ever seen a time when so many famous people, even in the church, even in the church, as well as in politics and entertainment, how many people have you noticed that all of a sudden, I mean, these are popular people that we, you, everybody knows the name, and all of a sudden, bang, they're facing some kind of a situation that is shaking them to the core and, and, and trying to destroy their integrity, trying to destroy their, their motivation and their momentum. The economic issues that we have gone through in the past. And now the political issues. All of these areas. People who are in influence. But not only that, but also just common ordinary people like you and me. Those average people. Those insignificant people. You see, because God is shaking everything. 
There's nothing. The writer tells us there is not one thing that can be shaken that isn't being shaken. Where do you go? I love that old song, Living Below in This Old Sinful World. Where could I go? Where can you go in this world to find the sense of hope and confidence and motivation to keep on? It's because God is shaking. Now, there are three areas that God is focusing on primarily. And just as God attacked the gods of Egypt when he led, directed Moses, you look at the plagues. Those ten plagues related specifically to the ten major gods of the Egyptian culture. And just as God shook and destroyed those gods, he is also doing the same thing with America's gods. And the three areas that you can mark it down where God is shaking is every society, every society that is built on godless values. So if you want a culture to be shaken, build it like Sodom and Gomorrah. Build it on a godless foundation that has no recognition of God's involvement. Build it on a culture in which even the very existence of man is not credited to the, what Scripture teaches us how man was created. We've talked about this in every year we've been here. I can't stress it enough. You as a human being are so uniquely created and you were created specifically to live in an intimate personal relationship with God. And when that relationship was broken with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, we were separated from him in such a way that we can't find our way back. And this is why he brought, sent his son Jesus to show us the way back, because he is the way back. But every culture or society that is built on godless values. He also is shaking every system that is built on godless purposes. Let me tell you something. If your system is built on the idea of having power, then it's going to be shaken. If your system is built on the idea of having money, having influence, anything that does not glorify God, anything that is not built on the idea that God is the center of everything and it is our relationship with him that is the most important. Every system that is built on godless purposes will be shaken. And then also every structure that depends on godless resources. So it includes our lives. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's a global issue, a national issue, a local issue, or a personal issue. These, this, this holds true. Why? Is it because God is rigid and because God is mean and God doesn't want you to enjoy life? No, it's just the opposite. It's because God created you for himself. And he wants you to live in that relationship. But the only way that you can do it is if you allow him to shake into powder in everything and anything that's in your life that is not pleasing to him. So we have to think about, about our personal motivations, our personal goals, our personal decisions. Does it honor him? Does it fit into his purpose and plan? Or am I trying to erect my own idol? Am I trying to create my own structure? Am I trying to depend on something you know, it's amazing to me how many Christians trust their banker more than they trust God. You see, you understand what I'm getting at? This is why it's so important to us. And then we need to ask the second question, and that is, why is he doing it? And I've listed, actually, ten things that, as to why God is shaking us. He's shaking us in order to show some things to the church. Listen, folks, I'm telling you, when Constantine in the 4th century adopted Christianity and legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire, there was a process that began 
that you and I still suffer the consequences of today. Because the church, over a period of centuries, ceased being the living organism in which there is life, and it became so institutionalized, and our doctrines became so creedalized that everything that we do now, we think in terms of nickels, as somebody said, nickels and noses. So we determine our degree of success as churches by how many people are there, how the offering was, and this, that, and the other. And I'm telling you that that may be fine and good in the human world, but it doesn't impress God. God does not demand of us, even as a chapel, that we become bigger and bigger, although that's wonderful to do and we're, it's nice to see. But God does demand of us that we be faithful, that we be true to his word, and that we be willing to trust him, that we be the intercessors that God has called us to be, that we be the witnesses that God has called us to be. And so God is using the shaking to just remind churches and denominations that that's not where the answer is. The answer is in Jesus Christ. See, one of the things that's so unique about Greer Chapel, I think, is the fact that we do come from many different denominations. And yet we find the common person of Jesus Christ, who is the center of our attention. And his word is what draws us together. Does that make sense at all? I hope it does, because that's what I see as being so unique. And I can tell you this, that some of the other resort ministries that have chapels like this, they do not have that kind of fellowship. And they don't have that kind of tightness and closeness with each other. I mean, good grief, how in the world can you and I care so much about people when we're separated for five or six months at a time and we never hear from each other, never talk to each other. And yet yeah, when we come back on the first, of, the first of June or the end of May and we get back together for the first service, it's like a big family reunion. It's because we care. We care for each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. And we see our presence in this community as being vital to the spiritual and moral welfare of the entire community. So God wants to show us some things. He wants us to show us, like Zacharias said, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. He also wants to purify us. That's one of the things. If you read Ephesians chapter 5, when the Bible tells us that when, when Jesus Christ returns, God is going to work in our hearts to such a point that when Jesus returns, he will have a pure and holy and spotless bride. <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Let me see. Then he also wants to prepare us for persecution. And he wants to de de demolish these proud philosophies that have come into our, into our culture, like relativism and socialism and materialism and so on like that. So there's a lot of these things that, that, that are a part of why God is doing this. But keep in mind, God is shaking us. He's shaking the world. Why? Because the world is his. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, everything in it. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 6, he said, don't you understand that your body, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, don't you understand that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify him in your body in your spirit. And so when we look around and we see all this stuff where the political thing is so confusing, it's like, it, it's like a bowl of, of cooked spaghetti. I mean, you can't figure it out. But your hope is in the Lord. You see. Now, how do we deal with this? Well, I've listed some ideas and you can look at those and see how they fit. But basically, the main way that you have deal with all of this is you have to put your focus and attention on the Lord and you must allow Him during the shaking 
There's only one solid place where you can stand in these days of shaking, and that's on the person of Jesus Christ. There's a psalm I want, us, I want to just look at here. It's Psalm 91. I want you to listen to this. This is amazing to me. Let's see. Where are we here? Listen to this. This is so amazing. Let me just read it to you. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress and my God, in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will seek refuge. Nowhere else. Don't go looking for a Democrat or a Republican to, to keep you safe, folks. His faithfulness is a shield and it's a bulwark. You will not, listen to this, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will not only look on with your eyes, you'll see all this going on and realize it's not impacting me. Because my hope is in the Lord. And you will see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge. Even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you. Nor will any plague come near your tent. That's the promise. So the protection for the shaking that is going on, and it's going to continue. As Paul makes it very clear in his passage in 2 Timothy 2, I think beginning in about verse 15, he says, in the last days, perilous times will come. It's not maybe, it is certain. And we have to understand this. And this is why one of my favorite songs I took time to put on the back of the sheet. I want you to listen to it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. And in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within that veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood. They support me in the whelming flood, and when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. And then the hope that we have, when he will come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone and faultless, to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. <laughs> all of the ground is sinking sand. The wonder of the shaking, it is to destroy anything and everything that is contrary to the nature, the character, and the purpose in you. That process will continue till the day that our Savior comes. And the second reason the shaking is here is so that you and I will remember the first. And we will allow the Holy Spirit to generate and create in us and of us exactly who we are meant to be and who God had in mind for us to be before we were ever born. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Let's pray together. Father, forgive us for being frightened and intimidated and anxious with stuff going on around us. Remind us of who we are and remind us of who you are. And don't let us fear the political upheavals and all the garbage that's going on. Don't let us fear the missiles of North Korea or the poison gas of Syria or the attacks of the terrorists and Taliban. 
but remind us that our hope is in God. You are our refuge and our strength, and we need not be afraid. And we thank you for the time together this morning just to be reminded of that. Let us experience and let us go with the attitude of confidence. Attitude of comfort, but also the attitude of confidence and courage. Just as God told Joshua as he began to lead the children of Israel, he said, be courageous, be courageous. And so I pray that that will be our hearts today, and we will look at life from a positive and an and adventurous journey as we continue seeking you and continue walking by faith through the life that you've given us today. We do pray for the very special, critical needs of our nation and our world and of our friends and our own family. But don't let us get all bent out of shape over the shaking that's going on around us because that's not the last chapter of the story. Remind us again of what we have to look forward to. We have strength for today, and we have bright hope for tomorrow, and we thank you for both. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, one of my favorite newer songs, number 229 in the hymnal, Diane and Joanne are going to come and lead us in that song together, because he does reign.